Hallelujah. I told Pastor if he went on any longer, my iPad was going to go down. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, well, this is this is a uh, this is a place that gives me a sense of being home. I I love I love the atmosphere, the presence of God, and um, I love what God's doing here and. Uh, how much I appreciate your pastor and, and Angel and the rest of the Hackenberg tribe, which gets bigger and bigger. It's like, you know, but uh, it's it's great to be here with you. I uh, I want to hurry up and get get uh, preaching this morning. Um, there's two things I want to talk about. In uh, we've just gone through probably the most significant season of the year each year as we've gone through uh, Passover, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, uh, that, panic, that Passover uh, encounter, that, that, that special season of the year when we remember all that Jesus did. It's all connected, Feast of Passover and, and Unleavened Bread and, and Feast of First Fruits. It's really all, all connected in, into this Passover story, this pageantry. Of, of the, the of God coming and sending his son and, and Jesus dying and taking on our, our sins and our, our shame and taking it upon himself and, and being, uh, being crucified and being buried and then raising again from the dead on the third day, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And I want to I talk to you about that at, along with Pentecost because in these two uh, festivals, all of Passover and, and Pentecost, it's really two first fruit celebrations. I want to talk to you a little bit about those. Uh, first, let me just talk a little bit about Passover. You're all so familiar about uh, with that, and I, I want to talk to you a, a little bit about this incredible picture. You know, as, as we go through the, the Gospels, we see over and over Jesus talking about the cup. You hear him mentioning the cup. The, the, he, he, he spoke uh, over and over again about this, this cup that he was to drink, this, the cup of, of the Father that he was going to give to him. We, we see it over and over. We celebrated communion this morning, and we, we partook of the cup. And, and, uh, and of course, that, that was the cup of blessing. That was what Jesus gave. But that's not the cup that he talks about throughout his, his experience on earth. It was something that was so traumatic, if you will, something that was so staggering and earth-shaking that Jesus, uh, in the garden before he was betrayed and, and arrested and crucified, Jesus, it says, sweat as it were, great drops of blood, and in, 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 in passionate cry, he called out to the Father and he said, if it's possible, in Mark chapter 14, he said, Lord, if it's, fo if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Three times he said that he went back to the Father. If it's possible, God, if there's, if there's another way to do this, if there's some other, other avenue we can take, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. We see it over and over again at his arrest. There on that night in Gethsemane, John chapter 18 tells us about this arrest, and, 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 and Peter, you remember Peter, uh, takes out his sword to, to defend Jesus, and, to, and he, you know, you wouldn't want Peter in a duel. You know, he cut off the high priest's servant's ear, you know. I mean, if you're going to protect them, you probably should cut off his head, you know. He wasn't probably the best swordsman. And Jesus told him, Peter, put up the sword, Shall I not drink the cup that my Father has given me? Over and over we see this. I mentioned there's a difference between the cup that Jesus gives to us and offered to his disciples. It's the other cup. It's the, it's the Father's cup that he would drink. It, the one is the cup of redemption and one is the cup of, of blessing and the other is the cup of wrath. 
He spoke to James and John. You remember James and John? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the gospel writers says it was their mother, but I got a feeling that either the mother put the, bo the boys up to it or, or they put the mother up to it, you know, about uh, asking Jesus when he comes into his kingdom, if, if the one could sit on his right hand, the other sit on his left hand, you, you know, it, it's amazing, you know. These guys, we wouldn't let serve on our church board. You know, I mean, they, you know, it's like, Jesus just tells them, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles. And they're saying, hey, you know, when you come into your kingdom, how about if I sit on your right and he sits on your left? And Jesus says to them, listen, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And they said, we are. And he said, you will, but it's not mine to give of who will sit on my right and on my left. This cup of, of wrath. It, it's interesting that in, dur during the, the last three months of Jesus' life on earth, Luke, Luke begins it around chapter 9 uh, of the Gospel of Luke. We see these last three months or so of Jesus' earthly life. And, and we see him continually moving towards Jerusalem. At the beginning of that time, Jesus takes a couple of his disciples, James and John, up onto the Mount of Transfiguration, and where he's metamorphosed before them. They see the glory of the Lord. It's interesting that as they get up there, the, a cloud covers them, and, and, and when it lit, Peter sees Jesus speaking with Moses and speaking with e, uh, Elijah and and. and Peter, of course, is the one that says, you know, Lord, it's cool that we're here. Let's, let's not ever leave here. <laughs> let's build a three tabernacle. It was probably during the Feast of Tabernacles it, when they would build booths. And Peter was saying, let's build a booth, you know, here. We give Peter a lot of grief for that. You know, Peter, Peter was the one, like many of us, that hap happened to speak before we think or say something, you know, before we actually thought it out. I have done that once or twice in my life on a daily basis. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I thought about it, that I don't know if we should give Peter so much grief. I got a sense that Peter is up here and seeing the majesty of God, seeing uh, Elijah and seeing Moses. There's something about that atmosphere. I think what Peter was really saying was, Lord, this is what I've wanted all my life. This is what I've longed for. Let's stay here. We don't need to ever leave here. Let's just stay right here in the presence. And then the cloud came and lifted, and they only saw Jesus and, and the Father speaking to them and saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. I, I don't wonder, what was Jesus or what was Father well pleased with about Jesus. I mean, he hadn't been to the Garden of Gethsemane yet where he prayed, not my will, but your will be done. He hadn't been to the cross and hadn't been crucified yet. Hadn't been, what, was God, what was God pleased with? I, I, I think that he was pleased with a life that was lived as a perfect man. He lived the perfect life. No incongruence with the, with the purposes and the plan and the will of God. He was an absolutely perfect example of what a holy life should be. At that moment, Father God could have translated him up into glory and been justified in doing it. And Father could have spoke to the disciples and said, now you see how you should be. Now you've seen a perfect life. You've seen a perfect example. Now go and do it. And we'd still all be lost in our sins. Listen, because he didn't come simply to be an example. He came to be a savior. We didn't need an example. We've had ex plenty of examples, and we haven't been able to do it. We need a savior. And it says that, that instead of God translating him to heaven, it says that, that Jesus came down off the mountain. And the first thing that happened when Jesus came down off the mountain, in, in Luke, I think it's around chapter 9, when it came down off the mountain, the first thing that happened was a man came up to Jesus with his son. And Luke, Luke gives us a beautiful picture. He, he comes to Jesus and he says to him, 
Lord, if you can help me. This is my only son. I could say, this is my only begotten son who is demonized. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't help him. But if you can, would you set him free? The only begotten son of God, instead of being translated into glory, came down off the mountain so that the only begotten son of God whom he loved could touch the only begotten sons of men who are demonized and set them free. He came down off the mountain for my sake and for your sake because he had a purpose. He had come. There was a cup that he still needed to drink from. There was a cup that he still needed to partake in. And he set his face. Luke says he set his face like a flint going up to Jerusalem. And then over through the rest of the book, you see Jesus leading the way. Luke says it. Jesus leading the way up to Jerusalem. There's a, a, there's a cross there. There's a cup there. I need to go and drink. This is why I've come. And it says over and over, Jesus going up to Jerusalem. Jesus making his way to Jerusalem. Jesus leading the way to Jerusalem. There was a there was a destiny that he had come. This is why he was born. There's a cup that he must drink at. There's a cross that he must bear. You know, over and over, we see this progression going up to Jerusalem, and nothing could stop it. There was one time, as he went through one town, they wanted to get rid of him. They didn't want Jesus around. And they said to Jesus, Jesus, you need to get out of here because Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus said to him, you go tell that fox that I work today and I work tomorrow and on the third day I will be glorified. Nothing would stop the prophet. Let me say, nothing except one poor woman beaten down by life and, and discouraged and disheartened. An uh, uh, issue of blood for 12 years so that she was separated from everybody in her family, from her home, from her, her neighbors, from society. She was an unclean person. And everybody looked at her and said, you're unclean. Get away from us. We don't want you near us. When she heard that he was coming, and she pressed through the crowd, she, she could have been arrested. She did what was illegal to do. She went into a crowd of people, maybe crawling on her hands and knees, getting up there where she could reach out and grab a hold of that tzitzit, that tassel that hung from his garment, that tassel that was specially woven. That book of Numbers tells us they were to wear on the, on the four corners of their garment. To, be rem so to remind them of the commandments of the God, of God, so they would not prostitute themselves and go after false gods, but they would serve the, the one and true God. And there was something in her heart that said, I know if I could just get a hold of one of those tassels. You know, one of the uh, writers said that she, she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. But, but really, it was if she could just grab a hold of one of those tassels. You see, because, because desperate people don't just touch. Desperate people grab a hold. Grab a hold. Listen, and she reached out and grabbed a hold of that, and Jesus stopped and said, Somebody touch me. And everybody, everybody jumped up and said, Lord, everybody is touching you. <laughs> that everybody is, is slapping you on the shoulder, grabbing your garment, and, 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 and touching your head. And, yeah, what do you mean somebody touch you? And Jesus said, No, no, somebody touched me in faith. I felt virtue glad. I felt, I felt. Somebody made a demand on my ability. And the progress to the cup was paused while he said, who touched me? Who made a demand on my ability? Let me, let me tell you something. God is never too busy. God is never too busy for you. God has never. I've had people say, oh, you know, oh, hey, pray for me. It's just a small thing. I don't need prayer. I mean, God's, God's got a lot of things to do. Oh, yeah, he's got a ton of things to do. But there's nothing that's more important than you. When you come to him and say, God, and she stopped, and Jesus stopped. Says, somebody touched me. And when she was found out, there kneeling on the ground, Jesus looked at her and said, my little daughter, he used the most gracious, loving term he could use. My little daughter. 
She had never heard anybody say that to her. At least for the last 12 years, there wasn't a kind word spoken to her by anybody. She wasn't even allowed to go into the synagogue, into the temple, to worship, worship her God. She was unclean. But the king of the universe, on the way to Jerusalem to drink the cup, stops. And all heaven stops in its place because of one person that said, if you could help me. And he said to her, woman, your faith, my little daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Actually, he didn't say go in peace. He said go into peace. He didn't even say go into peace. He said go into shalom. Shalom isn't just peace. Shalom is total wholeness and well-being. In one moment, because she pressed through the crowd, all of heaven stopped and God spoke to her and said, now go into complete wholeness and fullness in your life. We can surmise by that for the first time in 12 years. She was able to walk down the street without people jeering at her and saying, get away, get away from us. But seeing people say, look, there's the woman who would not be stopped. There's a woman that pressed in through the crowd. Now look at her. Made completely whole. And Jesus heading up to Jerusalem. He had an appointment with a cross. He had an appointment with a cup. He came down from the mountain to bring life and healing. Nothing could hinder his progress. What was the cup that Jesus had to, had to drink? What was the cup that was so Something that, that, that was so grievous to him that he, 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 he drew back from it. What was it that would make him sweat as it were great drops of blood and plead with the Father, if possible, let this pass from me? Was it the great pain and anguish and suffering that he would, would endure? You know, a few years back, it's been a number of years back now, ago, that they... They, they produced the film, the, the Passion of the Christ. Most of you probably have saw it. Uh, uh, it, it, it was gruesome. They did, a, they did an in, incredible job of showing the physical suffering and the pain and the shame that Jesus had to bear. As I looked at it, I, I, I didn't get the same feeling that, that so many of my friends got when they went. I looked at it and I said, the pain was awesome. The pain was, was gruesome. The pain was, was, was hard to even look at or imagine or see. Was it the great pain? Was it the anguish, the suffering? Was it, was it the, the, the beatings, the crown of thorns uh, that they would, they, the soldiers would, would hit with a, with a, a, a reed on the top of his head and drive the, the, the thorns down deeper into his brow? Was it the nails? Was it the suffering, the shame, the hum humiliation of one who had never done anything but good? Was it the mockery of the soldiers or, or of the crowd? Or, or was it, was it the, the thieves that had, had heaped insult, the weight? The guilt of sin that would be heaped on him? Was it the, was it the malice of Satan's glare at, hi, at him? What was it? Most importantly, I think the cup was that Father God would turn away from him for the first time in all eternity past. Suddenly, the presence of the Father would be taken from him and he would cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The great sorrow, the great penalty that Jesus paid for, the cup that Jesus drank for us was separation from the Father. Separation from knowing his presence. But understand something. It wasn't Jesus' cup that he drank. He had no sin. He had no shame in his health. It, he drank it for us, for you and me. It was our cup. The suffering and the pain was ours. The abandonment, the wrath was ours. He took our cup so that he might give us his cup. Back to John, 
when Jesus was arrested. I remember, he said, shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? Jesus, in Matthew chapter 27 and Mark chapter 15, it tells us that as Jesus, after his beating and after his, his mock trial, and as he walked through the streets with, with people uh, yelling and, and glaring at him and spitting on him and ridiculing him and mocking him, so much so the weight of the suffering and the pain that he suffered, he fell to the ground and, and someone else had to come in. Simon had to come and help carry the cross with him to Jerusalem. And when they laid him down on the ground on that, rough piece of wood to prepare to nail his hands and his feet into that wood. It was common practice for them to offer a cup to him, to those being crucified. It was a cup with, with wine and, and gall mixed into it. It, it was, if you will, a, 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 like a sedative to calm them down. Listen, it wasn't done to bring relief to the person being crucified. It really was to help the soldiers from, from having someone fighting against them, kicking and screaming, even in their weakness. It was, it was given to them to sedate them so that their suffering could be expanded, could be, they could be suffered longer periods of time. They offered Jesus that cup, that numbing cup, Mark says he wouldn't drink it. Matthew says, he told him, get it away from me. I don't want to have anything to do with it. It says, Mar Mac Marthy, uh, Matthew says, he refused it. Jesus wanted to be fully alert to accomplish and complete all of the wrath of God's wrath upon him, all the divine judgment for sin, to be fully alert until he could finally declare, it is finished, and drink the cup. Jesus refused the cup that was urged upon him before his crucifixion. Then as he hung on the cross, he cried, I thirst. Psalm 75, verse 8 says, In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. But in John chapter 19, beginning at verse 28, it says, Jesus, knowing that everything had been finished, said, I thirst. And they gave him a cup. And when he received it, he drank it to the, to the full and said, it is finished. And when he received it, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Because Jesus had said, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and the power to raise it up again. He drank all the cup of God's wrath on sin that those who receive him may drink the cup of blessing in the presence of the Lord. Jesus drank the cup of wrath that we might freely drink the cup of blessing. That's what we drank this morning. He left A spirit of being deserted and orphaned so that you and I could be never abandoned again. So that you and I could be whole. Passover and the Feast of un Unleavened Bread. We see this incredible picture of, of Jesus. But listen, as awesome and wonderful as Passover was, and that we find redemption for our sins. We find forgiveness of all of our sins. We find ourselves reunited with our Heavenly Father. Restored into fellowship with Him. As awesome as that was, it was just the beginning. 
there was something more that Father God had done. There was something of his Ruach HaKadosh, his spirit, the holy, that he desired to take and pour into human beings without measure. A cup that would overflow the fullness of his Holy Spirit. In Jewish circles, back in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Numbers, they were instructed after Passover, the Sabbath after Passover, to begin to count 50 days. There was a jubilee coming. There was a time of freedom and fullness that was about to come. And so they were to count 50 days. The ancient rabbis saw something in this counting of 50 days from Passover until Pentecost. They said it was almost as if they were connected. It was almost that Pentecost was the completion of Passover. The ancient rabbis said that the goal of Passover was not freedom. The goal of Passover was fullness. The ancient rabbi said God didn't take them out so that they could be out. He took them out so that he could bring them in. Let me say something to you. God didn't bring you this far to bring you this far. He's got so much more for you. There is, he's got a greater encounter for you. He's got a greater dimension of his blessing and his power that he wants to pour upon you. Jesus told the disciples after his resurrection and, and then his ascension, he told them to go back into the city and wait until you, they be endued with power from on high. It's significant that both Passover with the Feast of First Fruits, Passover and Pentecost are both first fruits. Pentecost, or the, the, the Feast of First Fruits, was the, was the beginning of, of the harvest. They would go out into the field at, at first, the Feast of First Fruits and they would, they would cut the, the first sprouts that would begin to come through the ground. And they'd cut one or two or three or four or five of them and they would take them back to the temple and there give them to the priests. And the priests would weigh these up before the Lord. It was the Feast of First Fruits. But let me say, the Feast of First Fruits was a feast of faith. The harvest the full harvest was not coming for another couple of months. And so they waved them in faith. They were, they were believing God. They were thanking God that even though they're just seeing the sheath, the full harvest is about to come. They, they understood that this is just the beginning of it. And so they would wave that before the Lord. The, the barley just breaking through the ground. It was a wave offering of faith. Of, of faith. It was the promise of greater abundance. It was a promise of more. Pentecost is the culmination of that. At, it, at, in Acts, the feast of first fruits or the waving the shoots, but at, Pente or at Pentecost, they wave not, not just the first shoots that come through the ground. They wave not just the, the grain that had come full, but they waved two loaves of bread, the fullness, the completion of it. And they waved it before the Lord. The two, the two loaves waved up before the Lord, symbolizing the fullness of God's promise. The fullness that God, that our faith had been rewarded. There was a harvest that was still to come. Pentecost is this wonderful picture of the fullness of harvest. Now listen, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, we, we read every Pentecost Sunday. And, and a lot of times, if you're me, a lot of times during the year. It says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Understand that Pentecost is, was not a 24-hour period that we look back to and say that's when the Holy Spirit was given to the church. It wasn't a day. It's not talking about a day. It's talking about a new season that had begun. This is the season. We are living in the season of the Holy Ghost. We are living in the season of Pentecost that started on that day of Pentecost and won't end until Jesus comes back again and breaks through the crowd. And only then there will be a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It'll be the latter day rain. 
like we have never imagined before. Let me tell you something. As wonderful as it is here on this earth, growing in the Lord, learning more and more about Him, seeing the outpouring of the Spirit, we are going to spend eternity growing in our knowledge and love for the Lord Jesus and for the power of the Holy Spirit. We are going to begin to have revelations of God that, that go on for, for millions and millions of years, eternity to the future. We are going to grow in our love. And now, here on this earth, we begin to grow. Pentecost was a season. Since its beginning, the second first fruits. When Peter preached that sermon on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. It was, it was more. It was an abundance. That's what, that's what Pentecost, it speaks about the abundance. But let me tell you something. Pentecost is still a first fruits. Still a first fruits. Pentecost didn't end. Pentecost is going. And since that day, 2,000 years ago, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit began, and 3,000 came to the Lord, since that day, there have been billions who have come to faith in Jesus. Numbers that we cannot count or even imagine. Staggering numbers from all over the globe. People who have put their faith. Why? It's the season of Pentecost. It's the season of the Holy Ghost drawing in the harvest. And that, listen, it is only going to get better and greater as the coming of the Lord draws near. I, uh, I you know, I look, at, I look at the day that we live in today and I'm thinking, you know, we are closer to the coming of the Lord than we've ever been. Duh. You know, you know that, that's probably true. <laughs> you know, every day that goes by, we're closer. But when we begin to see what God is doing around the world, we begin to see what's taking place in this world today as, as the, the ungodliness and the immorality, the perversion, the things in, in, the, in, the, in the sky and in nature that are taking place, when we see what we don't hear very much of, in the news, but when we begin to see what God is doing around the world, there is a stirring of the Holy Ghost of God all around this world that is beyond anything that we could have ever imagined or ever dreamed. There are people that are being saved by the tens and hundreds of thousands daily are coming to Jesus. There is a move of the Spirit of God. You know, in this nation of ours, we have spent the last couple of months watching Young people that have no idea what in the world they're talking about demonstrating on college campuses are chanting slogans that they don't know what mean, what it means. I've seen them interviewed. Well, what, what does that mean? I don't know. Why are you here? I don't know. But I'm against it. <laughs> Whatever it is, we see that. And the devil has glorified his work. He has magnified his work, and he has his cohorts who will bro broadcast and proclaim all that he is doing, all the ungodliness, all the, all the murders, all the, the, the crazy things. That, we, we live in a country today that sometimes I, I have to slap myself before my wife does. I have to slap myself and think, have we lost all sense of reality? Have we, have we lost? We, it's like we've been, it's like we've been hit with a stupid stick. <laughs> the decisions, the decisions that are being made, it's like it makes, there's no practical reason why we would do that. Why would we open up the borders of our nation and allow millions and tens of millions of people come in that we have no idea who they are or where they've come from or where they're at. What? I mean, does that make any sense? I mean, we want to welcome, we want to welcome people from other nations into our country, just like America has always done. And we have had policies and ways to, to accomplish that. But it's like we have, we have, are doing things that make no sense, that America has lost common sense. And we look at that, we think, God, what is happening? Because that's all we see. But let me tell you something. 
what is not being broadcast. And maybe a few places every now and you hear it. There is a move of God that's taking place on our college campuses across this nation. We are seeing thousands of college students on secular college campuses being baptized and putting their faith in Jesus or, or turning away from that. We see revival movements beginning to take place. Right? California is going nuts. I mean, they don't know what to do with thousands and thousands of young people being baptized in the ocean are turning to Jesus. God is a, listen, Pastor and I were talking about it yesterday. I, I love being with Pastor because we talk about revival. We talk about the, about the Lord all day long in between bites of whatever it is that we happen to be eating. I don't know if I like what we're talking about or what we're eating more, but I like them both. <laughs> talking about this incredible move of God that is taking place. It's, it's as if the devil has poked the sleeping lion. And the church is awakening. The church is awakening and saying, we're not going to give in to this. this we're still in the, in the land. Uh, we're still in the season and the age of the Spirit of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, folks, is not something for us to sit back with. Pentecost is what gives us power to go forth and be a witness for God. This is the season that we need to get a hold of it, that we need to say, God, fill me more and more and more until I can't contain it anymore. Forget, fill my cup, Lord. I'm I don't want a cup. I want the river. I would let the river flow through me. Let the power of God flow through me. Let me tell you something. Titusville doesn't stand a chance. It doesn't stand a chance when God arises. His enemies will be scattered, and the people of God begin to walk forth in power and an anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. This is God's time. This is God's day. Listen, God is, gee, I believe Jesus is coming back very soon. I really do believe that. But let me tell you something. I don't think he's coming back for a church that's just hanging on by its fingernails. I don't think he's coming back for a church that when they're gone, the world won't even know they're not there. You know? He's coming back for a glorious church, one that's without spot or wrinkle, one that is going to create such a vacuum in this world when, when hundreds and hundreds of millions of people suddenly vanish. And the world and the devil work over time to try to figure out what happened. They've been abducted by aliens. I got a feeling if, if that ever happened, it would be, never mind, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> if definitely, that would not be good. God, God is, is awakening his church. Pentecostal power is the answer that this world needs. They need a people walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to end with this. It doesn't really mean anything, but it makes you feel like I'm about over, about done. And, and, and Luke, pastor's looking at his, his watch, shaking it. Let me end with this. Huh? Thank you. In Luke, towards the end, I think it's chapter 24. Jesus talks to his disciples just before he's being taken up. And he, he says to them that, that this, is, this is what it, it is written. Luke chapter 24. He says, this is what is written. It is necessary that Messiah would suffer and die. Jesus told him that. This is what the prophets and, and, and the, the scriptures have said of old. It, it is necessary that the Messiah would suffer and die. And he said, it is necessary that he would rise again on the third day. And then he said, it is necessary that this message of the gospel be preached to all nations as a witness for me. His, there's a, the word... It is necessary. It, 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 it could just be translated as, as will. This is what the scriptures have said. Messiah will suffer and die. Messiah will rise again the third day. And, must, and this gospel will be preached. Well, listen, I can, I can go along with the first two. 
That makes sense. It was necessary that the Messiah suffer and die. We can all agree with that. We can say, yes, yes listen, if, if the Messiah didn't, didn't suffer and die, we'd be with, out of our sins. But if he didn't rise from the dead, we would just have a story of a great man to live with. There would be no life there for us. We would still be bound by death, by the final enemy. It was necessary that he suffer and die. It was equally as necessary. Without the resurrection, there is no life. It was necessary that he rise again from the dead. I can understand that. But then he says, it is necessary. It is equally as necessary that this message of the gospel be preached to all the nations as a witness to me. I think, Lord, if, if that message is not preached, the message of the resurrection, the cross and the resurrection loses its effectiveness. If the world doesn't hear, if the world doesn't hear with the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon them, the message loses its power. And so he said, it's necessary that this message of the gospel, I say, God, how could you put all the weight of everything, all the weight of your incredible plan of redemption on us? We we fail so many times. We don't get it right so often. And after that, he says, now go back to, and wait in the city until you be endued with power from on high, until you receive the promise of the Father, which will cause you to be my witnesses all over the earth. You see, the, the world is needing some spirit-filled people who walk in the power of the Holy Ghost, that when they speak, their words are anointed by the Spirit of God so that they are directed by the Spirit of God. If they live in the Spirit, they also walk in the Spirit, and He can begin to bring them to divine encounters. He can begin to take them into places. He can begin to give them insight of what's taking place in the Spirit realm. God is looking for a people full to overflowing of the Holy Ghost. Stand with me. I'm done. I, write, I ask it right now, Lord, that you would begin to stir up this house, that you begin to stir up this house with an anointing of the Spirit of God over our lives. Lord, I pray. I, Lord, you, you told, it, told the priests in the Old Testament their most important task was to never let the fire go out. With all the sacrifices, the animal slaughters that they were to do. The most important thing, the fire that you sent down from heaven, they were never to let that fire go out. And so they would carry it whenever they would break up camp at the tabernacle. They would carry the embers. They put a, a, a copper pot o, o, over top of it, and they would keep the embers would be in there. They would be, they would be hot, but the flame would die down, and they would go, and when they came to the next place to set up the tabernacle, they would lift up the, they would lift up the, the pot, and the, the breeze would come in and begin to blow upon the embers so that that original fire would begin to blow. There was something very serious about about. Offering strange fire before the Lord. Now listen, strange fire is a fire that God didn't start. And I'm afraid we got an awful lot of churches that are burning strange fire. They haven't heard from Jesus. They haven't spent time in the present. They haven't said, God, let your, let your flame burn in me. They've gotten all kinds of, listen, when the fire of God is not there, you've got to come, come up with all kinds of other things to do. I've been in, listen, I've been in churches where we've got laser lights shooting all over the place. We've got smoke pots. I, I've been in churches where they have synthesizers that's, that mimic the sound of a wind blowing. And everybody's going, oh. Was it God? Was it his presence here today? And I think, no, that was the synthesizer. That was the smoke pot. God is not looking for strange fire today. Listen, the fire went out. Ezekiel saw the fire, the presence leave the temple step by step. He saw it go out of the, out of the temple court. He saw it go, go through the eastern gate and, and down the, the valley and up, up the mountain, not to return again until that day of Pentecost 
when they were all gathered together in one place there up on the temple mount when the, when the high priest would begin to wave up those two loaves uh, speaking of abundance and fullness of harvest suddenly there came a, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind through the eastern gate over the disciples that they said and tongues of fire God's holy fire once again fell from heaven and rested upon them and harvest the last great day harvest began God is still longing for real fire holy fire to burn in his people let me ask you today how's the fire in your life have you been tending the flame have you do you find yourself just worshiping God when you're in church pressing into God just when you're we're in a prayer meeting or, or with the rest of the church, or are you taking daily? Are you going after God? Daily, are you spending time in his presence? This is the season of Pentecost. We're not waiting for another one to come. This is it, and we need to get in. We need to, we need to say, God, would you, would you take out of me anything that hinders my relationship with you? Take out, out of my life anything, God, that you're not pleased with, anything, oh, God, that, that distracts me from going after the, the fire. After the wholeness of God. Anything, oh God, that grieves you, that grieves your spirit, attitudes, words, judgments that we make on other people, impure things, things that we watch on TV or we watch, we watch on our computers. God, is there anything that I'm allowing to come into my heart that, that quenches the fire, that causes the fire to go out? Let me tell you something. If, if the fire is growing low, God has promised a, a, bur, a smoking flax. He will not extinguish. He will blow upon it. Let me ask you this morning. This afternoon. What's the fire like in your life? How do I, I want everybody all over the room just to begin to lift up your hands right now. And shut yourself in with Jesus. And begin to ask him, Lord, show me if there's anything in my life that's not pleasing to you. Show me if there's anything in my life that is causing the fire to go out. It's causing me to lose a sense of your presence and a sense of your glory in my life. Show me if there's any things, any allurements that the devil has begun to bring into my heart and bring into my life that causes me to run after those more than I run after you. Show me, God, if, if there's something I love more than you, something I'm passionate about more than you. Whew. Holy Spirit, would you begin to settle in your people right now? Would you begin to settle in your people right now? Settle upon your church right now. You're calling us, Holy One. You're calling us into a new place, into you, into a deeper place. Lord, today, today here at Hope Christian Fellowship, you want, to, you want to stir up the flame again. You want to stir up the flame again, oh God. Oh, you want it to burn bright in us. Oh, come, Lord. Oh, that, that fire of the Holy Ghost that gives us direction, that gives us warmth, comforts us. That fire that that gives us a effectiveness in our words that we have a, we have a tongue of fire we speak a word for Jesus and the Holy Spirit takes it and imparts it into someone's life and and suddenly they're broken before the Lord and we we don't even know what happened I pray God anointing to begin to flow over this house right now I ask for anointing to begin to fall in this house right now I ask God for a kindling of the flame a, kindle, a rekindling, oh God, of the flame of Pentecostal fire in our hearts and our lives. All over this room. All over this room, oh God. Lord, draw us if, 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 we've, if we've walked away, if we've, if we've gone in another direction, if, if we've not listened to the wooing of the Spirit. We haven't run after Him when we've heard Him calling us to Himself. Oh, Spirit, all over this house right now. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. 
Aleluya. 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 Oh, come now, Lord. Come now, Lord. Come on, just press in. Just press in right now. Just press in right now. Ruko Sororo Foko Yaba. Press in. Press in. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, Lord. Oh, Lord. We want the real fire again, God. I want the real fire in my heart again, God. I don't want to just be going through the motions. Lord, I want the fire again. Listen, if that's you, you say, God, I, I need the fire to burn. I need it to burn. I, 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 this is weird, but just, if it's you, just kind of have your hand cupped and say, God, I'm just bringing these embers to you. I'm bringing these embers to you right now. And I lift off, I lift off the, the copper kettle. I said, God, just begin to blow upon it. Begin to blow upon it. Begin to blow upon it. If that's you, just come on up here to the altar. And let's just stand here. We're going to begin to pray and seek the Lord for just a little bit before we head out of here. We say, God, I'm bringing, I'm bringing the embers to you today. I'm bringing the embers. Start the fire. Start the fire in me again. Start the fire in me again, oh God. Oh, Lord, right now, right now, right now, come on. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. God, that nothing, that nothing, oh God, would be more desirous in my heart than you. I bring the embers. I bring the ashes.